Well, that timing wasn't terrible, but it wasn't like Johnny quality. So I'm going to take it. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, what is it? Good afternoon. Yeah, it's afternoon pretty much universally, unless you're in Australia and then it's morning and I can't help you with that. Um, <laughs> so hello, Gidopsians. I'm awake, I promise. Um, minor announcements. Uh, we don't have a lot. I think that the CFPs for the co-located events for KubeCon uh, EU in the spring have closed. So if you didn't submit, don't forget to do it next year. Um, I do expect to be at KubeCon uh, Paris. I'm really, really excited about being in Paris because I have never been to France. Um, and uh, yeah, that that sounds that sounds like the announcements I had. I don't remember. Johnny probably won't be joining us today. He had a conflict. Boo, traitor. Um, he had, you know, day job stuff to do. Uh, but we do have our 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 guest, George Castor. George um, is... Um, Hello. I forget exactly what you do at the CNCF, other than that it's probably pretty cool. Um, what are you going <laughs> to talk to us about today anyway? <laughs> yeah, uh, so I'm on the projects team at the CNCF, um, kind of helping manage... Uh, there's like 174 projects in the CNCF. Some are graduated, some are incubating, some are sandbox and working on processes to make that more efficient and things like that. I'm on month five. So just finished my first KubeCon under the new job and kind of, you know, KubeCon's like that big energy where twice a year you get the recharge. So I'm excited about a bunch of stuff and I met you and then we decided to do this and here I am. Here you are. Okay. Yeah. So um, I know you have a hard stop. So for folks watching at home, just so you know, we're going to end the stream a little bit early today um, so that, you know, childcare can be accomplished. Woo. Yes. Go dad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, my childcare is also being accomplished by the dad in my household right now. So that's exciting. Um, anyway, uh, let's just get you straight to it. Uh, we're going to talk yeah. about Project Bluefin. I'm going to bring up your screen share and uh, you get to be the smart person and I get to ask stupid questions. Yeah, yeah. So this is Project Bluefin. This is a um, fancy website that I had done by some paleo artists and stuff that kind of give us the uh, the kind of mantra for the project. It's a custom image of Fedora Silver Blue, which is not the same as a distribution. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit, how we ended up here. And it has two use cases. The first is kind of you. This is more the non-technical kind of person where you want to set them up with a uh, like a computer, like a Linux computer, but you don't want to do any maintenance. Uh, those of us that created this thing are mostly cloud native folks. So we're trying to maintain the least amount of things as possible. So we do a uh, big focus on automation and GitOps and stuff like that. And that's how I ended up here. And then our second uh, target audience is developers, which is something that I'm really passionate about is uh, giving tools for the next generation of developers so that they could be open source maintainers at some point. There's this whole kind of idea that um, when people are talking about uh, sustainability and recycling laptops and all that kind of stuff, I almost feel like, you know, if we gave everybody a Linux with a container runtime on it, that would be a great teaching tool. So uh, I'm explicitly focusing on that audience that wants to uh, use Linux like in a professional capacity to, you know, learn how cloud native works. I want... Uh, this to be like our workstation uh, for people like us who work in the industry and you're a Kubernetes nerd or a container nerd. So it has a whole mission and, and all that kind of good stuff. To I want it to be a teaching tool for people that want to get into, into this stuff like Linux was for me when I was growing up. And then we have a video and a fact and all that stuff. And so that's the, that's the Hollywood page. Do you have, do you have any questions so far? Uh, no, I mean, obviously the dinosaurs are great. They're adorable. Yeah. I had, uh, I did receive a sticker from you at KubeCon with a great dinosaur on it and it's on my water bottle, which I didn't remember to bring down with me to show the audience. Uh -huh. So shame on yeah. me. Um, I do like the mission a lot. Um, so for me, right. Um, people who watch the stream regularly, they've heard me say it. This is not news. So I self-taught, right. I didn't go to college. Right. Um, and a huge part of my like self-taught story is the Linux user group that I went to in the San Fernando Valley. Mm -hmm. So it's like SFV log M. It hasn't really had as many meetings ever since the pandemic kind of cut down the in-person meetings. Yep. Um, but the founder of that, his name's Brian. Um, he, um, 
he worked with my husband and he was like, Hey, you guys should come to this thing. It's, you know, cool tech stuff with cool tech people. And at that point in time, I did not think I was going to work in tech at all. Like I would, you would not have told you I, I'm going to be a software engineer in yeah. years. Like that's not, was not what I was going to say. Um, and so, uh, but anyway, so he invited us and we're like, yeah, that sounds fun. We'll go. Um, and so it was really great because we had like, just like, kind of like this, like very casual tech presentations of neat things. Yeah. Like that was uh, like, T scale 2009 was some initial like virtual reality glasses were presented by some of the people that you know were were involved in that lug yeah um, and so i got like uh like a like a little bit of like an apprenticeship style situation going where i got to learn stuff and play hands-on with stuff and use other people's computers and linux distributions and all this all this you know it was like a like a little playground um for a for a a, a blooming nerd um and I had had my own computers and I, I'd always done like f my own firewall configurations and all this other stuff. So I, I was a little ahead of the curve um, on some of that, but it was all against like Windows machines. And so this was my introduction to Linux. And yeah. um, so that to me, I think that was like, it's really like, these are a lot of people who are involved in like the open source movement of, of the like late 1990s. Like, yeah. You know, all, like, so that's they, when I learned. Right? Yeah, exactly. The 1990s. Yeah. So they, they were involved in that. These are people who like, you know, were, were actively contributing to those efforts and so forth. And, you know, we're, we're like excited to get new people interested. And, and, and that lug, I wasn't the only person who learned at that lug. There was, there was a bit of a vehicle for, for some of the, the next generation, which, and now at my age, I'm thinking about the next generation. So I feel ancient. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, but yeah, so I, I love that, that, passion behind this project because it really resonates to like i consider myself like a child of open source right yeah. i am what the generation that grew up with open source software looks like i and and you know my career story is like anybody's my age is like really similar experiences in that way um so i think like for the for the next generation the next children of open source um especially because containers is where it's at like this is going to be invaluable and i have used silver blue personally on my it's, i have it installed on my on my on my personal laptop as well. Right. So I right. I, I'm curious about this from that standpoint. If I also use the thing. Yeah. So so my, it's interesting. The initial one was like you know I'm just gonna, you know, fix the things in silver blue that I care about. Right. But as you start to use the model, this kind of cloud native patterns as part of your operating system, it becomes it became pretty clear early in the project that you could use this as kind of because there are no lugs. There's like no lugs around anymore. And you can't just, if you just give someone an ISO, it's like, okay, great. And then they go on the internet and they read the wrong instructions and then they come back with like the wrong stuff, right? But like, what if mm -hmm. we could just template out what what a great workstation looks like, right? Like if you wanted to be a cloud native developer on Spring or, you know, some kind of framework or whatever, like, why can't we, why can't you just get that? So traditionally that's been like, install your operating system, go online, you grab a script and then you run it on your thing and it might set you up, you know, but then scripts, like it's like there's different distros and like all this kind of stuff. Just having that guarantee that there's an image that's kind of pre-made for you is a really strong pattern that we're starting to see. However, it took us like a year to just get the base images out. So we're just now starting to get into the, what does a Kubernetes workstation look like for someone who wants to like get pull that day, you know, mm -hmm. like right now we just include kind. Um, so the way, the way I learned about this pattern, you might, even if you use silver blue, you might not be using this because it's using the traditional OS tree. And in Detroit's KubeCon, uh, Colin Walters had kind of explained to me how they were moving towards this more OCI model, which is still composing the operating system with OS tree, but then it gets stamped out at the end uh, as a container image and then shot over the wire. So it still boots and stuff normally like it does traditionally. However, you could just use a normal OCI container as a transport mechanism. And you're thinking, okay, well, so what's the big deal? You know, I'm getting updates and stuff. What they did is they enabled us to also insert a container file as part of that step. And then we can kind of do the same kind of customizations and things that we would do for application containers in CI, except now the resulting app, instead of an app container, it's a container with a kernel. It's like the whole operating system is in there. Um, so a bunch of us got together and said, you know what, let's just grab Silverblue and just make 
make our thing. So I'd worked on distributions for a long time at Canonical on Ubuntu. And, you know, I had moved over to Fedora. And like with all operating, so there's like stuff you like from all of them and no one makes mm-hmm. your exact perfect thing. And I was like, well, if I could just shove stuff in a container, um, all I got to do is figure out the loop in GitHub. That should work, right? Um, so I did it locally and it sort of worked. And then I found out that it was easier to just go on GitHub and start grabbing GitHub actions from their marketplace. I and love GitHub some, actions. Yeah. And then some friends helped me cobbled it together and Universal Blue was born. And it literally is just Podman in a for loop with GitHub actions is, is the generalized description for it. Like it's not really, it's not really anything special other than like we were some of the first to go hard into the pattern, right? They're like, well, if we could do this, let's see if we can make an entire suite of operating system images, you know, and it started with one and now we have, oh my goodness, how many do we have? Um, yeah, and so you said, the question was, where is where did you blue come from? Which I suppose you sort of just answered, but I, I guess um, Universal Blue, it's it's named that because it's based off of uh, Fedora Silver Blue. Yeah, yeah. And the initial cut was like an Ubuntu desktop on top ah. of silver blue is what I really wanted, which ended up being bluefin. Um, but I kind of, I couldn't call it Ubuntu because. Right. Know, so that's, you blue, that's, that makes sense. Yeah. So I was Clever. like, you know what, that, that seems, that seems okay. So it keeps the U and then, but the blue is in there. And then uh, that's kind of neat uh, because it is just a container file. One of the first things we figured out is the GNOME desktop, um, has a key value store called dconf where it takes all the values and the keys and they're they're on the desktop, right? But you can export that. So what I did is I ran a dconf dump on my Ubuntu desktop and imported it into my Fedora desktop and then deleted all the keys that I got errors in. And then I had a GNOME desktop that looked like Ubuntu on top of Fedora. And that's where I started basing it off from. And as I started to talk to people, um, it was more of the, you know what? I just want to dock with App Indicate. Could you just make it look like a Mac? <laughs> um, so I was like, you know what? I I've been around with the desktop so long. I didn't want to like editorialize some stuff too much. So I was like, you know what? Yes, let's just let's just do that. We'll go with like an Ubuntu looking thing. You can always, of course, switch. That's just a default. You can always switch to the default Fedora thing because you want to respect the designer's decisions as well. Yeah. Uh, just give people an option. Um, so I kind of cobbled this together and I showed it to a friend and I was like, look, we could use the cloud pattern. Here's the container file. Here's Podman running in a loop in GitHub, which I'll show you in a minute. And they came back with, but I use the tiling window manager. This is useless to me. And I was like, oh no, we're going to have to, we're going to have to actually do GitOps. So I went to some friends and I was going to say, so people are going to be very annoyed to find out that, so I have a Fedora box, right? Yep. I have the dash, like the doc to dash tweak installed. I also use the tiling window manager. So they kind of overlap. Yep. This is, this is true, but I do use both. That will probably make some people completely crazy, but it's, I like the convenience of the doc for the launch. Yep. But I like the tiling window manager for the actual, like switching between things and the management and the closing and all that other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, I was more trying to solve the delivery problem, right? The (laughs) get it from where it's built to the user atomically, because the Linux desktop is still kind of in the stone ages where like you could do an upgrade and your package manager breaks. And it's like this most infuriating thing that can happen on a Linux box. Um, So in a way question. Oh yeah. uh, So I'm just going to put it up on the little screen here. You may be right about to answer this, but like, let's just go ahead and, do you need me to read it to you? I can read yeah. it. Um, so, oh, go ahead. Uh, so the question is, since silver blue is moving from one image to another, how different is this uh, from base silver blue? Is it mainly just using OCI images in a different way? Maybe this is a silly question. By the way, there are no silly questions. Yes, yes. Hi, Aaron. It's good to see you. Um, the uh, so, so when you use base uh, silver blue, that's being served to you via OS tree. There's like an endpoint in there. If you do an RPM OS tree status, it'll tell you OS tree something, something. And that is being served to you from Fedora. What this method does is instead of consuming OS tree natively that way, uh, you're grabbing uh, the operating system from a registry like key.io or Docker hub instead. So it kind of replaces the transport mechanism 
What you don't get is the nice diffs that you get with OS tree. So they're not efficient. So we're going to need container diffs at some point. Uh, but that's kind of like an industry. That's like an industry wide problem that needs to be solved that, you know, way smarter people than me are talking about. Um, the difference between these two is there are people who have modified Fedora Silver Blue. There's a project called Sodalite that is using the native OS tree and they have the composed YAML files that OS tree uses in GitHub. And then they use GitHub to make an image. However, it needs to be served to you as an OS tree. I think it's like an HTTPS endpoint or whatever. And I've never wanted to set up our own infrastructure. So because it's using OZI, it means I, I could use any registry. So it was the, one of the first questions I asked Colin, I was like, can I just serve operating system images right from the GitHub registry? And the answer was yes. So we are doing that. So what we did is everyone got together, figured out the packages, and then we matrixed it out in the GitHub action. So GNOME, KDE, this is uh, one of the tiling window manager ones, uh, a base one that doesn't have a desktop, LXQ, Mate, and Voxite, which is XFCE. Sorry about this. Um, and then for 37, 38, with and without kernel modules, um, so we make one, two, three, four. Actually, let's just do it so that when you go to the GitHub action and you execute a run, it goes through that matrix. Let's just give it a second here. And then starts to build all of these. So here they all are. Sorry, I'm trying to get the zoom right. I hope that, that looks okay. It looks okay to me. Uh, yeah. Audience feedback is always welcome. It looks fine to me. Yeah. So what happens is, is every day, uh, about an hour, we kind of timed our cron jobs. After Fedora publishes their OCI image, uh, we ingest all of these and we throw it through this container file. And then we make all of our images. So what we do is we kind of segment out the different packages for each of the desktops. And then we add things that Fedora can't add. So we add codecs, some... Um, so while that runs, I could just show you the packages that we add and this is all community maintained. So per desktop, we have a different set of packages here and then stuff that goes in every desktop. So you'll need to like control or command. Yeah. Plus. Yep. Sorry. Sorry go. about that. How do, how do we do that here? All right. So something we include in all our images because uh, Fedora is trying to make a general purpose operating system and we want it to be a little bit more opinionated, but we didn't want to be too opinionated. So we, 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 as a community, we figured out our policies on how we're going to make these. So we decided we're going to focus on hardware enablement uh, and, and things that like the community find really annoying, but generally speaking, we're not going to try to editorialize too much. Um, but that hardware enablement piece it's real though. It really yeah. is. Yeah. It makes all the difference. <laughs> so you might see this thing here so that you can get HEIF support for, um, for the thumbnails in your file manager, uh, the Intel media driver. Uh, so you can get hardware acceleration, uh, on your Intel stuff. Uh, the Android UDEV rules. We actually have a separate container, uh, that's nothing but UDEV rules and service units, which we called a config container. And this is just a, um, a scratch container that gets published an hour before we build the main ones that has systemd service units because we turn on auto updates. Uh, we do flat pack updates. And then in there, we add every game controller and accessory UDEV rule that we can find. Uh, and then we ingest those automatically and then gate them so that we can include them in, uh, in the distro or in the image. Uh, you know, things like uh, the hardware keys uh, for like uh, doing multi-factor auth, some fonts. Um, and then because we do do NVIDIA images, we do had, to, I, we added this thing called NVTOP, which is kind of like HTOP, but for your GPU. Um, this right here is the, just makes the, uh, uh, the sound quality on your headphones way better if you have like new headphones, this apt X, because I guess that's some proprietary codec. And then a, a few standard things like we had to have Vim or, or people will will like be really upset. Oh yeah, no, there would be revolt <laughs> in the streets. So like, you don't yeah. have Vim, I'm done. I don't even care anymore. Yeah, and then we have ones for each individual 
thing. And we call these the main images. And these are the bulk, the bulk of our images that uh, people, you can either consume this. And so if you like Fedora Silver Blue the way it is, you could just consume that. And then uh, you would have it with just those extra packages. And then we have a tool called Just, well, I'll talk a little about in a little bit. That's the, um, uh, it's like our task launcher that we use. And then after that, off of those base images, we have other layers for hardware enablement. So we have one for NVIDIA, one for framework laptops, uh, one for Lenovo laptops, and one for Asus laptops. And then with some for Surface laptops. And what we do is we, actually, let me just get you the architecture diagram here, is um, we derive off of those base images and depending on what they need, make certain uh, adjustments, but we do that in the container files. So you might have a Surface device and you go to the Linux Surface project and it says, if you have Fedora, run all these steps and then it'll put you on the right kernel and they've set up the coppers, they've set, they've set up everything. So we basically grab those instructions and we shove it in a Docker file. We say from one of these base images, uh, build, you know, follow these instructions and it will replace the kernel do all that stuff, and what comes out the end is a silver blue dash main dash surface, which has the kernel for the Microsoft Surface, right? Or if there's a tweak for a framework, the framework image has. Uh, we work with the framework people to get all the little tweaks that they need to get Fedora working perfectly. There's like three boot parameters that you need, so like we try to add those in there as shortcuts, so that that's one less thing for people to have to deal with. Um, so each one of these is in a repo and they are timed to basically fire off um, anytime there's like an update or change that the community makes. So if I look at the NVIDIA packages, it is the same packages that we were building with main before, except now they all have NVIDIA drivers. So the more hardware layers we have, the matrix of images kind of keeps growing, it gets multiplied by each one. Uh, we were the largest we've ever been two days ago, uh, but Fedora 37 just went out of support. So when we removed it from that little grid, you know, one third of our images didn't need to be built anymore. And then they get garbage collected by GitHub after 90 days. So, and each of these, we get stats on the polls. So 368,000 polls of silver, blue NVIDIA, we are about to reach 4 million pulls. Um, it's not an indication of users, but it does kind of mean that there's been 4, 000, 4 million updates so far. Um, so I, one of the things I love about this project is we get to provide real usage data for people to see like how well it scales and how all of that good stuff works. Because so far, the OS tree and the model and the OCI parts and all that stuff, most of the jank that people see are from missing features. Uh, that we would like, but you know, I've never, I've never gotten up and my computer doesn't boot, you yeah. know, that day or something. But if it does, it's like the same error that you would get in normal Fedora, and then you have that rollback mechanism, uh, which is really nice. I think you'd like this from a CI uh, perspective. There's currently right now a, um, a regression in Podman, where the major update. Um, broke people's running containers. So there's an issue upstream and that is fixed by, oops, sorry. And that is fixed by this little piece of errata. Sorry about this uh, right here. Um, so in chat, it was like, hey, everybody, we're having problems with uh, Podman 4.8.0. Uh, you know, and people are rolling back or they're pinning a version. So what we were able to do is pin it as part of our build process. Someone ran into this on Saturday and then we PR'd it in, rebuilt. Then we sat there and rebuilt all the other images. Um, now everyone who's on a universal blue images is pinned to Podman 4.7.2. So they won't run into this issue. And then basically we just follow along the open issue. And then when that gets resolved in Fedora, we wait 24 hours, we unpin it, and then our end users don't see an interruption of work. We've we've done this three or four times, which is really handy. There was a flat pack 
uh, regression last cycle where everyone's flat packs broke, like the binary, the package itself uh, was broke. So we were able to pin that and roll it back. And then when that was fixed in Fedora, we are able to uh, do that. And that kind of gives us that, uh, one of the slogans we use is like, we want to be your desktop DevOps team, right? It's like, yeah. oh no, I'm having a problem with my computer today. And you go to Reddit and someone's like, here's how you pin it, right? It's like the same thing, except someone could just do that in GitHub and then, you know, click click the buttons to watch the builds happen, right? And then for some people, they're none the wiser that they were, uh, th- that there was a, re- a regression at all. So I, I really enjoyed this pattern from a ops perspective. Um, any any questions so far? I haven't no, seen. I think you're covering it. I think yeah. I, what I'm seeing here is a lot of things that I think stands between your average person and Linux adoption. Yes, 100%. <laughs> um, right. And honestly, like I like I said, I so I use, um, I have one of, my, one of my personal machines. It's my gaming machine. It has. Yep. Two two partitions, right? It's got two two SSDs, and so one SSD is Windows, and I play video games on it, and the other SSD is Silver Blue, and I have now forgotten which OS tree is the one that had all of my modifications. I don't remember. I'll have to go find out the hard way. Right? Yeah, the, the <laughs> boot so that, menu. I wish that was a little bit more. Uh, yeah. Descriptive. Yeah. Yeah. So that um, that has been for me the highest barrier to entry on adoption, and then so much of like if I am doing anything development based, it's probably either work or it's open source. And I work at Red Hat, and they don't care if I do open source development on my work machine because sure, yay, right? So yeah. I don't bother hardly using it at all, even though I spent all that time and effort setting it up and getting all the encryption things the way I liked it and everything locked down because I don't yeah. actually have anything important on my on my gaming like partition there's there's nothing there it's literally just video games yeah uh, it's the other one that has the real stuff going on the, the things that i don't want access to and i'm just like oh i'm gonna have to do something i'm gonna have to do something it's gonna be bad yeah yeah we're, we are i'm finding lots of great we're finding lots of great issues in os tree and the installer and there's all also all sorts of the stack are being exercised in mm-hmm. this but like it's also not something I'd ever thought anyone would actually like as, as people started to use it and things like that, they started to become aware of the patterns and started to kind of dive in. Like we built this thing with probably five or six people, I think, but they're cloud people. So we were all kind of nerding out about the actions more than we were about the actual payload. Mm -hmm. So one of the goals that I want to do is like help popularize the pattern because once we do get designers and people who are, who are, um, like more interested in getting that UX to the user because we're, we're, we're SREs, right? Like we're, uh, yeah. you know, it's like I'm the UPS person, like the contents of your package, not really, I don't design that, <laughs> you know? So like for me, it's, it's more about solving that pipeline of getting, getting improvements and things to the users faster atomically. Yeah. Uh, because one thing that we lean hard in, especially so Bluefin, as I showed you this page is now we take, the main images, and then all the hardware enablement, and then Bluefin and Bazite, which is a sister project, are, are more of like the end product things that like, that's what I want to give my dad, right, is a Bluefin thing. And that kind of wraps it all together with like that strong opinion where we say, okay, when when my dad goes to Best Buy and he buys a tablet, like it has auto updates bundle by default, but like your traditional Linux and desktop operating system, they're, why are they always bugging me? You know, it's like, there's always windows popping up. So we sat around and said, you know what, if, if we know that automatic updates and stuff are a thing and, you know, we're supposed to be shifting left and all this kind of stuff, let's just turn that on and see how it feels. Like, would that be a total disaster if your Linux distro just did silent updates? It depends on who you ask. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it depends on your risk and yeah. all this kind of stuff. So However, from a general work workstation related stuff, the unattended upgrades have been, yeah, I, I think just fantastic for me. Um, yeah, and then I could see for people who are risk averse but they still want those security updates. Um, you know, as this technology makes its way to the enterprise Linux branches, right? People are going to actually get what they want, which is I want to make sure I'm getting the updates and stuff, but I also don't want you know, a major kernel release dropping on me in the middle of a Wednesday, like you get with Fedora, which yeah. I love to opt into, but I could see where some people 
you know, they'll see something like this and be like, this is really great, but I also don't want to be using rollbacks unless I have to. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, I, I want to make sure that the audience understands that the payload and the delivery um, are two are two different things. So if, you know, if, if you're the kind of person that prefers slow, well-tested changes and stuff, you could use something like this. It just wouldn't be based on Fedora. It would be based on CentOS Stream or RHEL or whatever whatever people are into. I don't know. Um, um, I, I Is this the part where I confess I've never used RHEL? Is that bad? Uh, it's okay. It's okay, <laughs> neither. But we do have a question. Is this similar to UBI? So UBI are like the container images that we do. Mm -hmm. And this is, I do want to talk about this a little bit because the operating system and things like that is, is all coming from that cloud pattern, right? And like, I could show you a container file and you'd be like, I, I, you know, if you're a container nerd, you're like, I totally understand what's going on here. It's just bash and, and Python and all that stuff. But what we did notice is a lot of people that are moving to this style of uh, computing, they might be more traditional Linux users who aren't in the industry or whatever. And they're used to typing like DNF install Apache or Nginx or, or, or dealing with installing their applications via a package manager and not a container. Mm -hmm. um, and this, I think, is one of the pain points right now that people are having. I see this with Universal Blue, with Silver Blue, with Kinoi, and a lot of them is, okay, I've got this thing. How do I use this for work? And the container nerds, I just tell them, hook up your Visual Studio code to your dev containers. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. That's all I needed to know. And then they go, you know, they, they go do their thing, but other yeah, they people go do the struggle. Stuff. Yeah. Right. And, um, and there's tools like Toolbox and DistroBox that kind of give you that, but you, you're in a container and sometimes people don't, they, that they don't grok that mental model. So for example, one of the things I love to ship is this one here, which is, here we go. PyTorch. So this is in our just file in Bluefin, you could just type just space PyTorch. And because the NVIDIA drivers and stuff are already on the host and configured, um, you could just start calculating to use PyTorch. Like you could just use PyTorch right away. So what we did is we took the PyTorch instructions for consuming the PyTorch Docker image that's made by NVIDIA and just put it in this file so you could type just PyTorch and it will go and Podman pull um, all the, um, uh, the container images that you need. And they get they get rather large. The NVIDIA PyTorch one is something like 23 gigabytes. Um, so at first you're like, wow, is this like really useful? But also if you've talked to people who have like NVIDIA machines and all they want to do is get PyTorch working on NVIDIA and you look through the instructions that people tell them to do, it very much like my, my inner Linux sysadmin brain says, wait, we have an image-based operating system. We have instructions that are basically code. Why can't there be a layer on top of your silver blue, right? That's like your silver, you know, your um, your machine learning layer, let's say, right? And you have community people that are saying, all right, we can enable consumption of PyTorch, TensorFlow, you know, Jupyter Notebooks, all that kind of stuff. So what we're doing now is this rudimentary just files to kind of prove them. I'm trying to prove the model to people to saying, you know, maybe the value for giving people these sorts of systems is that you can ship fast moving stuff as like a separate layer on top of the operating system. And because it's atomic, you can like throw it away. Or if like you want this stuff, but you don't like Bluefin, right? You can grab the snippets that you want and you can put it in your container file. And then your organization could say, you know what? We need a machine learning image. Let's grab all of this stuff for the stuff that we care about, throw out the stuff we don't care about. But the point is, is that organizations could then have, you know, a, a singular pipeline from their Git repository, be able to build the entire operator, sign it with SIG store and everything. So it's like the right, you know, the right stuff and then get that to the end user to enable stuff. Um, so just to clarify, this is, I've never seen just just before. Oh, and I yeah. feel, I feel oh, very yes. like I learned a new thing today. I had to go like, I went and I typed into my search engine, you know, just space CLI and yeah. like, Okay, this is a thing I learned today. Yeah. I learned. Yeah. Um, so I I got this. I, I've been a lot. I've been learned getting this one from a lot of cloud folks. That it's like it's like a stripped down make, but all it is is a task runner. So 
you just give it the command and then tell it whatever. So what we do is our community grabs a bunch of, because nothing is perfect, perfect. So we have mm-hmm. to ship workarounds and things like that. Um, you know, like we make, we have one to install Nix with DevBox. We have one uh, to install Garden if for people that want to use that, right? Like uh, JetBrains makes this tool called the Toolbox that just installs all of JetBrains stuff into your home directory and then doesn't touch anything of your operating system at all, but it gives you everything. All their compilers come with it and anyone who uses JetBrains could just use Toolbox. But in order to do that, you click on it and it's like easy to use Linux instructions and you click and it's stuff like this and it just drives me nuts because it's like the the Mac people and the Windows people get like a single click and then we have to type all this stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but I was seen, like, oh, maybe I can make it one for command. Linux. You you mentioned that on your on your blog lately that you've seen Homebrew for Linux. Yeah, like so I've been we've been struggling with Homebrew because I really wanted it to run it on the host as kind of like a mm-hmm. hybrid package manager. But when you install those libraries, it conflicts with the host. So we're gonna have to shove that in a container. Um, everything goes into a out. container. It's yeah, a lot of things. You know, and it's one of those things when I asked around some of the engineers and I was like, Oh, you know, I really want to be able to do homebrew so that it, homebrew is such a great complement to Flatpak, right? Because Flatpak mm-hmm. is doing the graphical apps and you want homebrew to do the CLI apps. Some mm-hmm. people think that we need, just need to repackage all CLI apps and Flatpak, and I think that's just boiling the ocean. That I don't think that's going to work. No. Uh, so I'm more of like, well, if I, you have a thing that exists already, can't we just bridge that gap UX-wise? Um, but it also, it has to be in a container. So there's there's still some work to be done there. There's a tool called Prompt that Christian Hergert is working on, which is a new terminal that has more native support for... Um, for containers so that like you could just go into your container and your CLI. Uh, and this, this terminal is maybe two or three weeks old. So there's a lot of new tools and convenience wrappers that people are always kind of t- constantly trying to say, I want my stable host OS. Um, I'm sorry about my dog. I have a beetle. That's fine. Mine this do it sometimes too. We just ignore it. Yeah. Um, but I also want all this because development is dirty, right? Like, you know, you get stuff all over your directories and you're installing stuff. And next thing you know, you have like half a pip installed. And why do I have three bins anyway? And why is, uh, why do they all have different contents? That's the right. one that annoys me. Yeah. And it's so easy to say, just grab what you want in a container. And when you're done, throw it away. But also I like having that state where it's yeah. like, you know, I, I like to have my cool, I call them the cool things that you read about on Hacker News. Um tools yeah. that you read it's like mm-hmm, and it's all they're always the same thing it's always a new rust tool right and then you go to the you go to the github page and they always have brew install and then for linux it's always like you know you either get for your distro and then there's like 15 options right oh or you get gosh, instructions right? like this that are um that are uh my favorite is when they don't mess. work and it's like a syntax error in the install file and you go to figure out what happened in the install file. And this, this actually yeah. happened to me with a CLI lately that I need for my job. So I won't say which one because I don't want to, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but um, it happened with a CLI that I absolutely must have. This is not, not optional. And it is something in the install file, which was Python was not working. And it had, I like it, the actual command was it went and it curled the file from where it's hosted and then tried to do it. It just was not happening. I was getting syntax errors and like, it was saying, I can't find Python. And I'm like, well, Python is definitely there. So you can't find Python for reasons I can't determine. And I was like, what other options do I have? And that was when I discovered that homebrew for Linux exists. And I immediately installed that and immediately it worked. Um, and I was like, wow, that saved me so much time. Cause that would have been awful. I would have been like doing PRs against some upstream thing to make this work for my particular distribution of Linux that they probably just didn't anticipate anybody was ever going to want to use this CLI for. Uh, I think you're muted. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to show you some of the builders running there. Um, one of the, um, I've always it's 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 interesting to me because there's Linux people have always been around like arguing about packages, you know, mm-hmm. and with, with this model I find it very interesting. So I use Fedora, but I don't use a lot of Fedora packaging in my day to day. Like I boot into my operating system, and because it's an image now, um, it's got 
we're always kind of universal blues kind of trying to figure out what is the smallest image that we can get that works on the most amount of hardware. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we want to leave the opinion off the image. However, in this transitionary period, there's people who just can't put a lot of their stuff in containers yet. Right. Yeah. Which is kind of why I'm targeting cloud native people first. That's why I call it a cloud native desktop. Like people are like, what is, you know, like you're not going to convince anyone to switch to this by calling it that. And I'm like, well, I'm not convincing any to switch because there's my target audiences in using Linux on the desktop. They're using Linux and cloud already. Right. Uh, what I'm trying to sell them on is the ops part, the um, the reliability, the rolling back, the being able to rebase to as many branches as you have space for, you know, and it, by getting those people to help us with the infrastructure. My hope is that that cuts the feedback loop from the people that do make the Linux desktop parts so that I can get the stuff that like I want the HDR enablement stuff as fast as possible so I can game. I have an AMD GPU. So I'm always getting the latest drivers and things like that. And they're all in the kernel and it's like this great user experience. Um, but it's getting that pipeline fixed. I'm trying to get pipeline engineers uh, more in interested in it so that they can help us kind of do that. Because a lot of this stuff in Universal Blue that Fedora will just do eventually. And like we kind of have a joke that we say, we can't wait to delete like half of this project. <clears throat> right. Um, because a lot of this stuff is what the, you know, this is like, this looks like a screen a distribution would have, right? Like yeah. a bunch of builders going. Um, however, for us, it's a great place to experiment with learning with actions and having the community be involved. You know, there's some of these actions here that uh, volunteer just PR'd into a CNCF project, right? They learned that at Ublue. And when we talked about the mission earlier, that's like, that's what I want to see, right? You know, uh, getting people more interested in the other things in cloud native. And this is kind of the gateway because it's your laptop. It's the thing you type on. So you know, that's, that's kind of what we're going for there. Okay. Well, so I do want to do a time check because we have uh, yeah. seven minutes left. Um, yeah. Sorry, I get, I, get, I get a little winded, you know? No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we went through everything. Um, so obviously um, for, for those of us who feel like going, going deeper, this is a public, uh, public repo. This is an open source project. 100%. Yep. Go in, have fun, um, look at issues, Make a PR. I don't know. Yep. Do you have a contributor's guide? You want to like throw up a link I, I, right quick? I do have a contributor's guide. If you go to universal-blue.org and just type uh, contributing in here somewhere. There we go. Looks suspiciously a lot like the Kubernetes one that I totally did not steal it from. Uh, it's but not stealing <laughs> if it's open source. It's co-opting. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm really looking for infrastructure nerds. We could always our process of making Docker uh, the containers and stuff is great. There's a few great actions that we're using and discovering. Um, uh, we use SigStore to sign the images. I showed you before. If you, they're just containers in the uh, in the registry, so you can go, you can inspect them, you can check out our tags uh, where we put stuff. So you could Scopio, it's like Scopio inspect, just like you do your application container, except uh, look, there's a kernel, there's a kernel in there. They even put a label, how handy, you know? Um, so yeah, and then we're hoping that more people use these base images. You can fork your own, make your own, if like you have a certain use case that you want. And then we have Bazite, which is the gaming version that runs on Steam decks. It's sort of working on the Legion Go the as the Asus Ally is a work in progress, and they're just starting to enable the new OLED Steam Deck. So there's a community of folks there who are just basically they love grabbing patches from all over the internet and making Fedora run on them. Um, and then that's what Bazite is, which is like a it runs on the, it runs on the Steam Deck hardware and stuff itself. It's it's pretty great, and you can find that at Bazite.gg. I still I'm not on this this Steam Deck train. Um, oh, I love it! I love it. Now's the time. Get it. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. So I had uh, like a PlayStation Portable, right? I mm -hmm. have. I've had lots of those little handheld gaming things, and I never seem to bond to my handheld gaming device. Um, it's like it's like my Nintendo Switch. I have a Nintendo Switch. I've got like 15 games for it. I cannot seem to. It does not hold my attention. Something about that whole experience doesn't work with me 
but right. you give me a PlayStation or like my PC and you sit me up in front of that screen and I will sit there yeah. on my sofa and then, oh, it's been six hours and I've been playing Hades. Like, yeah. <laughs> and it's With 2 a.m. and I need to work at five. Like, I, I will do yeah. that. But something about this, it just does not. I don't know. I can't yeah. bond with it. Someone figure what, it out. Why can't I bond with it? What's great about Bazai is it's also a desktop. It's like Fedora, but a gamer set it up for you. Right. So it also runs on the Steam Deck. It runs on your desktop, but I have one connected to my television and it's just like a big Steam Deck and you connect your Xbox controller and it works. And it's just basically, you know, when I get a new kernel on my, on my work laptop for Fedora or whatever, and I go to a game, I'm running like the, I'm running the same operating system everywhere. And it's Fedora just with those extra atomic layers on top. Right. So if, if you look at all the decisions that we make and you don't like them, the, the pattern I want you to come away with is like anybody can make this. It's, these are just the decisions we made. So we're kind of hoping that people just fork. Cut and paste your own decisions. Do what you want and, and, and just and spit out the images. actions. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, the actions are there, folks. If you want to go build your own. What you call it? Uh, it's not a – what it was the word for? We for call it a custom image, image because distro image, implies yeah. – I you know, it's a different model. And I, I do want to say that like, you don't fall into the mistake of making your own distro. What you do is you leverage Fedora as a resource to handle your stuff. And you're just toggling the switches, stamping out the image and then giving it to someone. So it's, cool. it's not a distro. There's like a different nuance take there. Um, but that's the conversations I think that people will be having over the next year or so as it starts to come in production. In we should do this for cell phones because my husband always complains how much he is unhappy with the uh, opinions of, of of Android. And it's like, I was I'm always just like, just I always tell him, I was like, just go fix it. Just go fix it. I'm going to show him this and be like, uh -huh. look how easy it could be to fix it. And so it's a lot simpler, like you said, than using, uh, than doing a whole new distribution from scratch. So an image. Let's try it. Let's see how that goes for him. Yeah. Yeah. And then like whatever desktop they want to use or whatever, like we have that and uh, we accept PRs. Uh, usually just by using it, you're going to find something. Uh, this is very, this is still not in Fedora proper yet in 39. So we're, we're as fast as Fedora is, we're kind of pushing the turbo button a little bit harder. So just, you know, we're looking for people that want to help we, hot rodders to help us, you know, make this better. So when it lands in Fedora, we're all happy. Yay. Well, <laughs> it'll, you know, eventually I'll get around to updating my silver blue box and remembering which OS tree is the correct one. <laughs> well, the great thing is when you update it, it doesn't matter. You're always up yeah. to the latest one. So that's you know, true. You, you can't mess that up. So. That's true. <laughs> that's like the best part. Um, all right. Well, we've got two minutes. Uh, closing thoughts. Anything you want to say before we, we let the audience go? As a reminder, we had a, a hard stop. So we're, we're ending yeah. today's stream early. That just means you have to make it up to us next time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just uh, give it a shot. Even if you use uh, stock Fedora, Silver Blue or Kino White, rebasing between these and Ublue images, it's an atomic operation, which is like really cool. So you could try it and be like, well, you know what? This isn't for me. Base, you know, rebase back to stock Fedora. You could try somebody else's image or you could try your own. And uh, if you're familiar with like Docker files, Podman, and Cron, then uh, yeah, you could do this. That'll be fine. Okay, last question: uh, Is Elemental from Rancher the same as this? That I think is more. I think CoreOS and Elemental are analogous, but I am not sure. I've not looked at Elemental in a long time. I haven't either. No idea. Yeah. Couldn't tell you. Um, well, thank you so much for this. I think this has a lot of implications. If we had more time, I would talk about why I think this would be good for IoT servers because that's oh my something God. I did yes. before. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I I had to make we had to make custom uh, operating system images for our IoT servers with with opinions in, uh, added. So yeah. I I'm like, server and IoT are going to consume this like that's already happening, right? Yeah. Like there, are, yeah. you know, that's going to happen. I think bringing it to the desktop was kind of the weird, you know, that's a huh. I guess we can do that on the desktop is kind of the yeah. the thing that our project is trying to figure out. Awesome. All right. Well, we are exactly at time. So I'm going to um, hit the end stream button in a second here. Before I do that, I uh, will tell people that um, we have changed the time going forward to uh, for GitOps Guide to the Galaxy. George, you can drop off at any time if you have to go. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Um, so we have changed the time for GitOps Guide to the Galaxy, just as an FYI. Uh, Johnny had a permanent conflict. I had a permanent conflict. So we've moved it up 
an hour. So instead of being 12 noon Pacific Standard Time, this uh, future stream will be at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. We have not decided if we are streaming on December 21st because neither of us know whether or not we are uh, at work that day. Um, and uh, as an FYI, we um, are still looking for somebody to talk to us about how like CI, CD, build, release works for video games. If you are that person, please reach out so that you can come teach me something live because I would like to learn something live. That's my favorite part of this job. Um, so if I don't talk to you uh, all before the end of the year, have a happy new year, all of the happiest of holidays, uh, whatever you celebrate or not. And uh, choose your tech debt wisely. See you in 